Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to explore space, time, and consciousness. With me is Dr. Vernon Nepi, a neuropsychiatrist head of the Pacific Neuropsychiatric Institute and author of a book about consciousness theory called Reality Begins with Consciousness. In addition, Dr. Nepi has written a trilogy of books on the topic of deja vu and has also written a book on psychopharmacology called Cry, the Beloved Mind. Welcome, Vernon. Thank you so much, Jeff, for inviting me again. It's a pleasure to be with you, and I'm sure our viewers appreciate, based on the range of topics you've covered in your books, that you are a, a person sometimes called a polymath. You're familiar with many different disciplines, and uh, people who have heard some of our earlier interviews will, will know that you're a specialist in uh, the brain and in uh, parapsychology and in various states of consciousness, but now we're going to get into some more abstract philosophical philosophical topics, the nature of space, time, and consciousness itself. And I, I suppose as a starting point, well, I, we might begin with the notion that these are, in your work, linked at every level. Space, time, and consciousness can really not be separated, if I understand your work correctly. That is true, Jeff. And in addition, the easiest way possibly to begin this is to move backwards a hundred years. The scene is the 21st of September, 1908. The speaker is a German physicist named Hermann Minkowski. Mm. And he is addressing in Cologne the 60th Academy of natural scientists and physicians. And he is about to present a major paradigm shift. And he says something like this. The views of space and time are forever changed. No longer do we have a separate space and a separate time? They are linked. Definitely. Like a major union. We move forward. A century later, I meet up with Dr. Edward Close round about 2008. Who is the co-author with you of Reality Begins with Consciousness? Exactly, except Ed and I like to call ourselves equal authors. Mm. A lot of our model is circular in terms of vortices, mm -hmm. and if we could, we'd have our names rotating around <laughs> in terms of equal <laughs> authors because uh -huh. we've both been doing all of this work equally. Mm -hmm. So we move a century later, and suddenly we have the next dramatic paradigm shift. Now, how dramatic? We know for years we've been talking about space-time, Minkowski space-time. People who are familiar with my book, The Roots of Consciousness, will see, for example, Minkowski diagrams that show space-time. Exactly. Uh -huh. They're and taught to undergraduate physics students everywhere. Right. And now suddenly we are saying the views of space, time, and consciousness cannot work on their own. Their separation. They are dramatically and irretrievably linked at every level. But this is not only a linkage, it is 
a beautiful, magnificent union. It is a union that we call tethering. There has to be a linkage always, more than a linkage, because it's like an arm and a shoulder. You cannot separate out the fingers from the elbow. Now, I used to play tetherball as, as a child, and it's a, it's a big ball that's attached to a pole by a rope. So you're, you're suggesting that there's something attaching space to time to consciousness. Exactly that, like a boat or a ship that is moored, that is linked there. It's linked there in time, in space, and in consciousness. They cannot be separated. Mm -hmm. So you might say, well, what's so big about this kind of idea? What is so big about this kind of idea is always in our physics of science, space and time were regarded, yes, as space-time. And then people said, but we think, we do things, we're aware of it. And we have this little thing that almost escaped from the brain, we call it consciousness, and that consciousness is just part of the neurons in the brain functioning well, and then we get conscious. And there were all sorts of ideas as if this was a single component. Mm -hmm. So it was like the one was a derivative of the other, that consciousness was derived from the brain. And then you had the theorists who said, oh no, there's no such thing as any of what we're experiencing in terms of reality. This is all an illusion. We just have this consciousness, this awareness, and what is space and time, or what is mass and energy, are all inside that consciousness. That's sort of the Vedantic point of view. Right. Mm -hmm. This is the whole component of the idealistic monism yeah. as opposed to the monists who are very much materialist that's all in the brain. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you mentioned uh, René Descartes, and there one had the component of dualism, mm -hmm. where the brain and the mind were separate. In our theories, we don't even use the word mind, because frankly, I don't know what mind means, and we're just further perplexing everyone by using it. So our model has been a major paradigm shift, rightly or wrongly, and we maintain it's very much a rightly component. But we have a shift in terms of thinking, that if you put the extent of consciousness, and I'll explain that in a moment. Yes, because Rene Descartes suggests consciousness has no extent. Right. Yeah. If you put the extent of consciousness in, mm -hmm. and you have space and time, we can call these all substrates. They are all measures, they can all be mm -hmm. measured, and Space can be measured, usually in our physical world. We have length, breadth, height. We have three dimensions of space, for example, and you can measure it in inches or in meters mm -hmm. or even a length such as a light year. Mm -hmm. And we have time measured in seconds and in hours and in days and in years. Yes centuries. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to measure. We have stepwise gradations that are exactly the same mm -hmm. according to our thinking definitions. Yep. Extent of consciousness, we can't measure that. How do we measure it? Well, I do remember as an undergraduate student in psychology, they had a measurement called the just noticeable difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, and what would be a just noticeable difference would be one component, mm -hmm. or we could say his condition is mild or moderate mm -hmm. or severe or profound. Yes. We are using ordinal jumps. Mm -hmm. We know there's a difference between profound and severe, but we don't quite know what that difference is. And psychological measures usually or should be done using ordinal Statistics. This mm -hmm. is ordinal measures of jumps. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ordinal meaning that it, it, it relates to the position, but not necessarily to an absolute distance. Exactly that. Mm -hmm. Now we can measure consciousness this way. And strangely enough, mm 
we have to be able to measure space and time like that as well. Mm -hmm. Because it's one thing to talk about space in our physical dimensional world, yeah. but what happens when we go beyond it? What happens when we go beyond time? When, you know, we, in our world, we've just got one tiny moment in time, we call it the present. Wait a minute, five seconds ago, that was the present, it's now the immediate past. Yes. And then we have a remote past, mm -hmm. and we can go a few seconds ahead and go into the future, mm -hmm. the immediate future. It's almost contemporaneous, but not quite. Mm -hmm. And then we can go into a distant, distant future. Yeah. And so we have a linear dimension of time and we have space, which extends outwards. This is very, very important because by the time we get to space extending outwards, it's impacting far beyond our ordinary little dimensions that we know of. And we might have to measure those ordinarily as well in terms of good, better, best, mm -hmm. as opposed to one, two, three, four, five, where there's a real equal distance between each component. Good, better, and best as relates to space? And as relates to time, and as relates to consciousness, because as we start mm -hmm. merging higher and higher, we might find that dimensionally in terms of that extent, and this is what we mean by a dimension, we define dimensions very, very precisely, very exactly, and dimensions have extent, are measurable, mm -hmm. as opposed to content, which is not measurable, but we can measure content like mass, Mm -hmm. and energy, right. and incidentally, another kind of consciousness, the content of consciousness, we can only measure those indirectly by measuring them through these substrates, through these dimensions. Very important differentiation, because people sometimes talk about space and time, and they talk about mass and energy as if they are equivalent components, but they're not. They are very, very different. The one is a container, the content. Mm -hmm. The other is the measure of that container. And that measure of the container cannot exist, because we're talking about fundamental existence here. It cannot exist without that mass and energy or that third component which you will hear later on, we call Gimel mm -hmm. as a third substance. We think it might be pure content of consciousness, but we don't want to be presumptive and have scientists saying, well, I can't prove that this is pure consciousness. So we're calling it a third substance, a third process. Gimel. In addition to mass and energy. In addition to mass and energy. So we have two fundamental dichotomies here. We have extension, mm -hmm. and that extension can go on forever and ever dimensionally. And that space and time. Are, are, and mm -hmm. extent of consciousness. Yes. And that's why at that high extent of consciousness, mm -hmm. imagine going up and up and up and up, and you get to the transfinite, the so-called transfinite. We sometimes call it the 10th plus dimension, because in our work, we have demonstrated that 10th plus dimension is the transfinite. It goes higher and higher. It's still got its measures. It still is what we call quantized. We're talking about a TV. Mm -hmm. TV has tiny little pixels. We cannot see those pixels. We see a continuity. Right. But of course, we have frames in terms of it. We have computers where we have little bits in terms of measures that are all binary. Mm. These are all little components that are pixelated, that are quantized. Mm -hmm. And this is what finite reality is all about. And the transfinite, when we get to the top, is also pixelated and quantized. And this is all what we're talking about in terms of extension. Well, now, my understanding, uh, if I may interrupt for a moment, is, is that the quantum theory applies to 
matter. It applies to energy and uh, to mass. It doesn't necessarily apply to uh, extent or mathematics that we can, we can go way smaller than the Planck length mathematically if we wish to. You're right. And this is the whole, I will not say contradiction, mm -hmm. but conflict that one has because for Dr. Close and myself and some other thinkers, mm -hmm. we think that mathematics is fundamental to nature, fundamental to reality. This was the insight of the great Greek founder of philosophy, Py Pythagoras. Right. And in that context, we have the situation where when you're applying mathematics, you're applying mathematics to existence. Mm -hmm. You are applying mathematics to our experience, mm -hmm. but it has to be focused somewhere. Yes. So here's an example I mentioned to you nine dimensions yes. and when one mentions this others are busy saying well you know we really only have three dimensions of space length breadth and height mm -hmm. in a moment in time and it's all in this little box and we call this physical reality yes and how can you say that because surely you're contradicting everything that's been found in physics well, mathematicians and physicists have been dealing with higher dimensions of space now, or more additional dimensions of space for over a century. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So now, suddenly we have, first of all, this little contradiction of three dimensions of space in a moment in time, not contradicted because none of the laws of physics, none of the problems that have been found in that context then get contradicted by going higher in terms of dimensions. Right. And the search for dimensions has been a search for a long, long time. You know, you had Kaluza Klein in terms of a fifth dimension. Yes. And Albert Einstein spent the last 20 years of his life life looking for further dimensions. Yes, indeed. And when mathematicians have been searching for other dimensions, the point I was going to make was there is a difference. When mathematics is part of reality, it has to have a substance of reality. If you want, you've mm -hmm. got your extent, but you've got your content as well. Mm -hmm. When you take string theory, String theory remains a theory, you know, 10 dimensions, 11 dimensions, 26 dimensions, whatever you want, hundreds of different string theories and super string components. But when you start looking at it in terms of fundamental truths or fundamental proofs at that Pythagorean level, at that level of reality, yeah. that then means you have to link it with certain components. And for example, with our nine dimensional model, we were challenged for 50 years. Nobody could calculate why, for example, a very esoteric angle in particle physics called the Kabibo angle was a ridiculous figure of 13.04 degrees. Nobody could work out where does this come from? Mm -hmm. How could they this be derived mathematically? Mm -hmm. Well, we were able to show this along yeah. with several other features and show mm -hmm. that this can be derived. So here's the focus, the focus mm -hmm. in terms of reality, in terms of existence, that this can be derived from nine dimensions, not from eight, mm -hmm. not from 10, not from 25 or 26 or three or four exactly from nine. Well, there are many constants realities. in physics that seem mysterious. In fact, uh, according to the anthropocentric theory of the universe, human life would only be possible because these constants are precisely where they are. Exactly that. And this is so much so because you mentioned that word life, and it introduces this idea of existence as opposed to our experience. Our experience is this restricted three-dimensional reality of space in a moment in time and throw in a bit of consciousness because I'm not gonna leave out that consciousness even there. But that yeah. consciousness is very limited mm -hmm. and limited within the brain. And you go higher and higher and depending on the relative levels of dimensions you're examining from the framework of, you know, people use the word non-locality. I use the word relative non-locality, relative to an examination of dimensions six, seven, eight. 
how does this get experienced? Throw in this, and suddenly you have different kinds of consciousness, and we think different kinds of time. We cannot prove there are three dimensions of time. We know there are three of space. It's not more than that. Mm -hmm. And we know, we think, there might be several of consciousness, and we think it might be three of consciousness. But that makes up the nine. But mm -hmm. the important point here is there's a major difference between experience, which is our day-to-day -day experience, mm -hmm. and existence. Now you might say, well, this is all ridiculous. Why does he have to get so much more complex? <laughs> Why does he just not talk about just this ordinary world? Well, existence, I gather, you're suggesting, you, you, like, this sculpture exists, but it's not having any experience? Well, I'm not sure. Okay. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. It's a whole new area. Yeah. What I'm talking about mm -hmm. is this is what we are seeing, what we are touching, what we are feeling here is our overt reality as opposed to our covert components. And that covert reality extends not only through the nine dimensions. We hypothesize this in our reality begins with consciousness. Mm -hmm. In our second edition, we were able to prove it thereafter. So we tested our hypothesis in terms of our model. Yes. But it exists all the way through beyond that quantized quantum Mm -hmm. of volume that exists in everything, yes. in the finite, it went all the way through to the infinite. And the infinite is a continuity. Now, this sculpture, or this whole room, or ourselves, mm -hmm. are all units within that finite and that infinite reality. So I'm differentiating existence from experience, and we experience our physical reality, but we know there's something beyond that. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we know there's something beyond it, and this is why Dr. Close and I developed a model to try and explain this. We call it a paradigm, but because it's a paradigm across several different areas of endeavor, across the areas of physics and chemistry mm -hmm. and cosmology, astrology, astronomy, and across psychology and biology, philosophy, consciousness, we call it a paradigm shift. It impacts all of reality. Mm -hmm. Some have used the term theory of everything, which I loathe because it is so contradictory in terms of what people understand. But the point about it is this is where this direction was. And the reason for this was there were certain basic contradictions in terms of our current laws of physics. Or if they weren't contradictions, we didn't understand link-ups of gravitation and relativity or where uh, quantum physics fitted into all of this. We knew that there were steps in evolution mm -hmm. and we weren't just talking about continuities there. But the major contradiction was a certain area of research, consciousness study research, where we were looking at psi phenomena and psi phenomena with due respect, with the strongest, best kinds of methodology, and also with a whole string of spontaneous phenomena, mm -hmm. did not fit our fabric of our three dimensions of space and moment in time. So we needed to go beyond it. That's a very good point. And even more so, for those who looked into the data on survival of some component of our existence after bodily death. Mm -hmm. This completely contradicted just the idea of a little brain that was doing everything. Now we could ignore it, and it's very, very convenient in physics and in science and psychology to completely ignore it. In this. fact, if you want to keep your job in academia, it's probably a good idea. <laughs> That's a good idea. So, you know, uh, fortunately in academia, we do not need to uh, ignore the fact that the Earth is not really flat. <laughs> but it's the same kind of idea. Yeah. So if you find on the one hand that you're talking about 
the ordinary physics we live in. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, that you're talking about psi and survival and the various contradictions of physics or the conundrums that we can't explain uh, where you might find subatomic particles that are distance apart mm -hmm. in time and space. Outside of the Minkowski light cone. Outside that, yeah. and yet have immediate uh -huh. communications. I, yes. You start uh -huh. saying, hold on. Quantum you entanglement. Have dimensions. Yes. Now, you might say, but why are you guys talking about all this? You know, Einstein would have discovered it, all these physicists would have. Yeah. Well, it's a bizarre phenomenon that somebody like Einstein, who clearly had link ups with the idea of a god, I mean, there's several mm -hmm. quotations there, you know, a god does not play dice, for example, did not implement the idea of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Close and I developed a model of what we call triadic dimensional distinction vortical paradigm. And don't worry and, about that. Yeah. Vernon, we are out of time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, time is time goes quickly <laughs> when you're having fun. Vernon, thank you so much for being with me. We will continue our discussions. Thank you so much, Jeff. And thank you for being with us. <laughs> Thank you.